Greetings, everyone, and we are now back with the Jim Dara Goddess Soulless Reading um, and Interpretation of the book Soulless, The Case Against Dara Kelly. This is part two, and we're just going to go right on into it. So the family moved a lot in Robert's childhood, and um, so according to this book, they lived in the most dangerous block in Chicago. Um, back then Robert and Carrie both said Joanne, their mother worked at Rosalind community hospital in the South side neighborhood of the same name, not far from the house. According to her two sons, she was an EKG technician and a phlebotomist. The hospital, which was long struggling financially had been threatening to close down, could not confirm employment records when he inquired. The family moved a whole lot. Back then, the projects didn't seem as bad as people made it out to be, Kelly said in his book. Now, what is happening is Solus is now becoming Solar Coaster because these are the same exact things that Robert Sylvester Kelly wrote about in his book, and it's on the playlist if you need to go back and review it. The whole book is written um, by Robert Sylvester Kelly. So he's talking about the fact that he couldn't read and write. So why Derogatis would put this in his book makes me wonder. Um, um, so we're going to keep going. Robert and his half-brothers frequented the theater. He talked about that. Um, he's basically making soulless solar coaster. So this is talking about his favorite singers talking about um, how his mom could really sing and going to church and moving with Lulu and all of that. He's using, he's literally writing the solar coaster book all over again. So sad. Um, he talked about his family and what they did in the house as he was growing up. Um, wow, this is so much all the same book. Talked about Kenwood Academy. He used that. I know he's going to begin now to talk about Mrs. McClinn, and he does. This should be a copyright infringement. He's saying nothing different. Literally nothing. Okay, Kelly also says in Solar Coaster that he worked as a male stripper. Okay, we talked about that. I think it's very important the image you portray. Kids identify with it. On stage, you have to be very careful. MGM's clean cut image extended to the lyrics of the songs Kelly wrote for the group. The music that they do, fast or slow, really has a message, said Eric Payton, the manager who allowed the four to rehearse and practice their dance moves for as many as eight hours a day in his basement whenever the weather made singing on the rocks along the shore of Lake Michigan prohib prohibitive. They sing about racial harmony and we are family and about the dangers of drugs and let's get it together. But they also released an indie sing single and made a self financed video for the song, Why You Want to Play Me. So he's talking about the MGM, um, which was the group, the first R. Kelly group that won the, um, won the Natalie Cole Award. He was in Jet Magazine. So he's just watching, looking over. Okay. Talk about Barry or Mr. Hankerson. You got to understand that Barry was extremely hooked up in the black community. Extremely. He would come to Chicago and have lunch with Jesse da Jackson and dinner with Louis Louis Farrakhan. The man had juice. Like many people around Kelly, Hankerson could also show flashes of the menacing gangster and perhaps even act on them. In the mid 2000s, according to lawsuits documented by Complex Magazine, he bought an ex-girlfriend's hair salon so he could fire her. She also accused him of trying to blow up her car, charges his lawyers denied. 
But one music industry insider told me Barry always had class and he carried himself with more like a politician or a businessman than most of the people around Robert who could, you know, come off as pretty street. Recording contract in hand, his crew in place and Hankerson at the helm, R. Kelly in public announcement released born in the 90s on Jive Records in January 92. Its single Honey Love reached number one on the Billboard chart as well as approaching the two the top 40 pop chart, if only barely for two weeks at number 39, after lurking forward in fits and starts for a decade at a pace Kelly found excruciatingly slow, the 25-year-old singer and songwriter career had finally started to take flight. So he's just watching him, watching him grow, paying attention to what's going on, looking at the people who he in, embraced during this time. So chapter two is talking about, I promise you, baby come inside, now turn down the lights, R. Kelly seductive croons, because there's something that I want from you right now. Give me that honey love. His first hit is driven by an oozing groove and a lush backing track. And in the video, he literally pours honey all over a woman's naked body. The three singers who joined him in public announcement, Earl Robinson, Andre Boykins, and Ricky Webster, only appear out a focus hoovering the hoovering in the background R. Kelly clearly is the star lacking a truly great voice like Sam Cooks or Donny Hathaway's Kelly began to build a reputation through the way he sang his music he talks about it in every interview never stops talking about it I walk around every day with the radio playing constantly in my head he told the entertainment weekly as far back as my high school years. So he goes into talking about how the music introduces itself to him and how he was coming to be who R. Kelly is. So in this part of the book, Solace, he's making, this is page 32. Dara Goddess is making nothing different <laughs> than what was already written in the Solar Coaster book. Kelly spent months working on his second album at Chicago Recording Company. At times, Kelly was has claimed he didn't know his mother had cancer and she banished him from Rosalind Hospital when he rushed to her deathbed. I kept telling her I was sorry. I didn't know he told Chio Cooker in Vibe. She begged me to get out and I did. He said he returned and sat at the piano and the call that Joanne came while he was singing for you, he repeated that she had passed away. Same thing that happened in Solar Coaster. In that version, Kelly says that when he returned from his second European tour, he immediately joined his mother in the hospital. She said, please leave, please. But he claimed he stayed to bear his soul. I said, first of all, I love you and I thank you for everything you have done. Everything. And I'm sorry for every time I've been bad or did something I wasn't supposed to do. And I promise you. And she died right there on the I promise you. I called the doctor. They came in and they pronounced her dead. I was still holding her hand, but I finished my sentence. I said, I promise you, mama, no matter what, by any means necessary, I will be one of the best singers, songwriters this world has ever seen. Few people forgot the details of their mother's death and the discrepancies in Kelly's stories bothered journalists. A good deal of how we come away thinking of R. Kelly must hang on what we think of R. Kelly's relationship with the truth. And see here, I feel that dear goddess is stepping over his boundaries. He needs not talk about the emotional reflections of what Robert Sylvester Kelly was going through with his mother's death. And for him to write this in a book shows how undermined and throat cutting he is just to be seen because R. Kelly took the spotlight that he could never have. <sighs> to not believe him would mean that he is now lying about what happened at his mother's deathbed and that he is doubling down on the lie to my face. Like many others, Heath wanted to believe such is the power of myth. Several sources told me that once his career began to take off, Kelly actually shunned the mother he claims he worshipped. Why would he say that? What proof did he have in that? Robert cut her off. His half-brother, Carrie, said because Robert didn't approve of Joanne's relationship with Lucius. When Kelly got his first big check as an advance from Jive, his crew shamed him 
for buying himself a new black Mercedes while Joanne continued to drive a beater, a raggedy old Ford that she had to hotwire to start. I should have known there was something wrong. A friend of the family told me he was very reluctant to share anything with her. He refused to deal with her medical bills. She checked into the hospital under a false name, although he had the money. I think he was angry with everybody for not protecting him from the abuse to the point that he got started at the abuse himself. It sparked up something in him. 12 Play left some of the music press code in a year when the big rappers have either repeated tired outrages or outgrown them. Kelly's crew chart wise new jack swing is black pop's most depressing development wrote the self-professed dean of american music critics robert Christow. nevertheless the album sold more than six million copies in the u.s garnering top 20 with bump and grind which made it number one your body's calling and sex me parts one and two on the rb chart bump and grind elbow to side whitney houston's i will always love you to claim the top slot not surprising it's amateur became a sought after songwriter and producer for other artists including high five billy ocean tony braxton janet jackson and a promising high school student from detroit named Aaliyah. Aaliyah was born in Brooklyn on January 16, 1979, according to her birth certificate. Diane and Michael uh, Hofton chose their second child's name from Jewish and Arabic roots, meaning rising up or ascending. Um, so as we talk, you know, we go through the whole um, Aaliyah situation. She has a big voice and a bigger dream, and she wanted to be like Whitney Houston, and she wanted to be like some of the artists in her time. And at age 14, became the first artist to be um, to Black Ground Records, the boutique of her label by her uncle, Barry Hankerson. So right now we're talking about Barry Hankerson, which was a big name in the music industry already. So as a protege and mentor to uh, R. Kelly, well, R. Kelly being a protege and a mentor to Aaliyah means nothing when her uncle is already bigger than where R. Kelly could really take her at the time in, in this particular year. So why is it that the age of the situation and the mentorship and friendship and the producing and all that. And then the dark side of the story comes out later as having abused Aaliyah. So Kelly and Aaliyah appears on BT's show and they're wearing identical hip hop streetwear, which was, I think a part of the business that R. Kelly was in relating to a hip hop artist and they wore that to advertise and sponsor the the suit wear during the time. And so the lady asked, are you cousins? Are you friends? Are you in a relationship? Kelly laughed. I better go get my white Jeep. He said, presumably referring to the white Bronco OJ Simpson had recently driven while fleeing the police. Well, no, Aaliyah said, we're not related at all. No, we're not. We're just very close friends. He's my best friend. With that, she playfully tapped his arm. Mm -hmm. So as you see, nothing is being reported in on national TV for anyone to hold against later on, except for what society wants to believe. The other host later asked the origins of Aaliyah's album. She's um, talking about, you know, the second chapter, telling about her age, ain't nothing but a number. And many of the music scenes believed Aaliyah was older than the 15 years in her record company bio. So Carter asked, and for the record, you are how old? Aaliyah smiled, held her finger to her lips and playfully whispered, that's a secret. So, hmm, Kelly's growing Midas touch held as Aaliyah's debut sold 2 million copies and spawned um, with back and forth and You Are Love. Six months later, in 1994, December, the cover Super Freak 
um, in the newsstands in Vibe, noting that the first time in the nation's press, a rumor about him and Aaliyah came forward visiting a black beauty salon at the Gallery Mall. Smith described a group of women discussing R. Kelly because he's headline at the spectrum tonight and because word is he just word is he just married his teenage protege, Aaliyah, like the jocks on the radio in New York, Philly, Oakland and L.A., Folks are yammering about Kelly's marriage, making comparisons to Marvin Gaye and Jerry Lee Lewis, joking about Joe Bate and Robin the Cradle. So the illustration in this magazine cooked up in Cook County Marriage Certificate and um, in the suburb Rosemont near O'Hare, it actually noted Kelly's age, 27, but listed Aaliyah as 18. So Kelly pulled out of an interview with Vibe at the last minute and he was in his dress dressing room and um, the role manager, Demetria Smith, warned her not to take notes or ask questions. But two female fans in their early 20s walked in and asked not only about the alleged marriage, but about rumors Aaliyah was pregnant. Don't believe everything you read, Kelly said. The singer repeated that line often in years to come whenever he didn't completely avoid the subject of Aaliyah. She is never mentioned in Solo Coaster. In telling my story, certain episodes could not be included for complicated re reasons, reason authors note. So, of course, if you're under investigation, there are certain things that you are vowed not to talk about regarding um, publicity and being in the public's eye. I interviewed Aaliyah by phone for the Chicago Sun-Times a week after the publication of the Vibe article. My story previewed, previewed a Chicago concert debuting her album on New Year's Eve 1994. Smart and sassy in a sure but playful way, she told me the phrase that seemed to preside her name in every article didn't bother her. It's always Aaliyah and R. Kelly, R. Kelly and Aaliyah, but I don't mind being called his protege because that's what I am. Before that interview, I called Cook County clerk Dave Orr, and he confirmed that the marriage certificate and vibe was authentic. Hmm. But yet you remember what they said in the first part of this um, Dara Goddess, a case against R. Kelly. So, so, so list. Some of Cook County's information in the public records were all disorganized. So it's up to you to believe what you want to believe. But right here, I believe that if the certificate was authentic, then it would have been able to hold up in court. The officiant it named refused to comment about R. Kelly. I'm not going to say anything. The Reverend Nathan Edmond told me, if you want to know anything about him, you ask him. When we talked to Leah said she had seen the document and vibe, but she didn't have much to say about it. I saw it, but I don't really comment on that because I know that's not true. Now, this is coming from Aaliyah's mouth. When people ask me, I tell them, hey, don't believe all that mess. We're close and people took it the wrong way. We're really good friends. We known each other for four years, but it's a friendship and I will continue to be a friend. R&B stars, female protege tend to have short-lived careers. I totally a witness the Mary Jane girls produced by Rick James or Vanity Six produced by Prince. She giggled. Of course, there's a connection with me and Robert because he did write the whole album. But as far as the second album, he probably will do some songs, but it won't be a whole project. I do see myself becoming my own artist. If you know your own style and you're sure of yourself, you can definitely overcome the protege thing. So they call Wayne Williams, the Chicago based um, jive star. I'll tell you this. They ain't married. He said, you don't see no ring on her finger, right? As far as all that other stuff, I'm sure that's just media hype. Robert has reached a level now where he's going to get a lot of rumors. The more successful he is, the wilder they'll get. I know Robert and Michael Jackson were talking about this. Things get crazy and they get out of hand after a certain point. From beginnings even more humble than Kelly's, Jackson and his eight brothers grew up in a 672 square foot ranch house in Gary, Indiana, 30 miles southwest of Kelly's childhood home of the South Side. Jackson's had become a worldwide superstar, the self-proclaimed king of pop. While soliciting songs from the album became his story, past, present, and future book. I 
his managers gave him the demo for a song by Kelly called You Are Not Alone. Jackson liked it so much he flew to Chicago to record with the CBS um, star in 1994 as long as he longed, as much as he longed to work with the king of pop, Kelly had come to fear flying um, to the extent that he didn't want to travel to record at Jackson's Neverland Valley Ranch in Los Angeles, in Los Ovis, California. So we know this part from the R. Kelly um, solo coaster book. And as we're wrapping up, Kelly told me he'd enjoyed our conversation and he wanted to add one more thing. This is called show business. What I do in my music is what I feel, not necessarily how I am. I don't walk around with my pants down all day saying, give me a girl. People need to not judge what they see on the TV. Nobody knows Robert or what he's been through. Not R. Kelly, but Robert. R. Kelly is a thing on TV. So I just, wow, it's 21 minutes already. Um, so what are your thoughts? To me, I feel like people were judging what was going on because R. Kelly was the realist in the most sexual way during that time. I mean, you look at Rick James and Tina Marie during that, you know, specific time a little bit earlier, a decade earlier, and you will actually see the sexuality coming forth, the innovation of new sexual connections. And I believe that we as a culture, as an African-American culture, we tend to always be passionate about anything and everything that we do, whether it's art, whether it's dance, whether it's opera, whether it's, you know, uh, hip hop. Um, if we even go back and look at some of the street dance that happens in the choreography of like fame, going from fame all the way to the newest hip hop with, um, you know, the dancers going against each other. It's a lot of power and a lot of possession and a lot of energy. So I feel that we will always, as an African-American culture, never under be, we will always be misunderstood because of the passion that we vibe with on a national level, on an international level. So yeah. So dear goddess, I think he was, he is so consumed with trying to find out something, but rewriting solar coaster, that is totally wrong. I didn't even read like 35 pages of the book because it was the exact thing that was in solar coaster. And I feel that that's a copyright infringement. And if it was not approved by Robert Sylvester Kelly, I believe that he should be forced to take that down. He should be forced to, um, to ask for, you know, approval for, to even use R. Kelly's name in what was going on. Because the only thing that ties him to R. Kelly in and of itself is his stalking, excuse me, the years of stalking Robert Sylvester Kelly and the fact that he took his story and made it his own and called it the same thing. Solar coaster, soulless. But he just degraded Robert Sylvester Kelly in his rendition of the book. It's very sad. I don't like it. And I wish that there was a way that I could really communicate this. Okay. But right now I have my neighbor. He's coming in with his loud music. So we're getting ready to get off of here. And I thank you so much for joining, liking, commenting, and subscribing to this podcast. And we're going to keep moving. Um, we will have the f fourth reading of the motion with attorney Jennifer Bonjean and, you know, some of the reviews that I had about that in the motion and um, to let you hear it, to, to show you what's really going on in the appeal process. May 4th, 2022 is still the sentencing date for Robert Sylvester Kelly. Nothing has changed there. So if we see anything in the news, please inform us here at R. Kelly Appeal TV so that we will put it out for the wonderful individuals who are a part of our system here at the program. Um, R. Kelly Appeal TV has grown tremendously. And again, we really appreciate you for everything that you do. God bless you. Thank you. And as always, keep it 100 and we'll see you next time.